The Holy Gospel of this day is from the Gospel according to Mark, chapter 4. Jesus also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the land, night and day, while he sleeps. When he's awake, the seed is sprouting and growing. How? He does not know. Of its own accord, the land produces first the shoot, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. And when the crop is ready, at once he starts to reap, because the harvest has come. He also said, What can we say that the kingdom is like? What parable can we find for it? It's like a mustard seed which, at the time of its sowing, is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet, once it is sown, it grows into the biggest shrub of them all, and puts out big branches so that the birds of the air can shelter in its shade. Using many parables like these, he spoke the word to them so far as they were capable of understanding it. He would not speak to them except in parables. But he explained everything to his disciples when they were by themselves. The Gospel of the Lord. It's good to be with you today as you gather as communities of faith, <clears throat> either from your homes virtually or gathered in, in person following health directives. This morning I would like to walk through the text with you. In COVID, we've been denied all kinds of things, but it's also provided us unexpected opportunities to try something else. So this morning, rather than finding a pulpit to, to record from in what would look like a regular service, I'd like to just take this opportunity to sit at a desk and walk with you through a brief Bible study on the Gospel of Mark chapter 4. If you have a Bible nearby, I'd invite you to turn with me to the Gospel according to Mark. We will center on one of the parables from the, the two in the text today, and then listen carefully to God's Word for us in the middle of this marathon through COVID-19 and in the middle of all the other things that are happening in our lives. We pray. May these words of my mouth and the meditations and imaginations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So when you look at the Gospel according to Mark, <clears throat> remember, first of all, that it's a three-part narrative. All the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, have a, have a three-part structure. There's a prologue at the beginning. Like most prologues, they give you some idea, some hint of what will be happening in the text. And then there is a long section, which is the one year of Jesus' Galilean ministry. And then there is a short section of, at the end that is the, the, the narrative of his time in Jerusalem. So, Gospel according to Mark, we're going to be looking at the text today, comes from the Galilean ministry. I'll take you quick for a quick walk through the prologue in Mark, and then, and then into the text uh, itself in its context. So, as you turn to the beginning of Mark, <clears throat> you'll find that the prologue is very short, 13 verses long. Sometimes it's chapters long in the other synoptics. In Mark, it's 13 verses. If you look in the, in the prologue for for stories of the angels who see the shepherds or the wise men who follow a star, you'll not see it. All you find in the Gospel of Mark is kind of a raw narrative that doesn't really explain very much, but just presents it for you and, and lets you work through it. So in the Gospel of Mark, the prologue and these short verses, Jesus simply comes out of Nazareth and Galilee. So Palestinian province, if you like, has a northern section, which is Galilee, a center section, Samaria, and then, the, and then the south section is Judea, in which Jerusalem is. So it starts, Jesus coming out of the north in Nazareth, and is baptized by John. And when he's baptized, he hears the voice that says, you are my beloved son, I'm delighted with you, and then the Spirit comes on him. And also in the prologue, you hear that immediately following his baptism, the Spirit doesn't send Jesus to a big rally. The Spirit, in fact, drives Jesus into the wilderness where he is tempted by the Satan. Again, as you look in the Gospel of Mark, you might expect to hear a, a fairly long dialogue between the Satan and Jesus, uh, three different temptations. That's not in Mark at all. All Mark says is that, that he was tempted in the wilderness, he was with the Satan and the wild beasts, and afterwards the angels waited on him. That's the prologue. Our text is in the second, in the second section of the, of the narrative of the year in Galilee. It begins, the year in Galilee, Jesus' ministry begins with a summary statement, really important summary statement that will really be important to our text today as well. He starts by, by coming out of the wilderness and he brings this message. The kingdom of God has come near. Turn around and believe the gospel. 
as it happens, Jesus isn't the only one who's talking about the kingdom of God coming, a new age breaking in during that time. It's a time when Israel is occupied by the Romans. There are soldiers everywhere, all kinds of, of changes they're dealing with. And there are, are this is after an even more violent uh, uh, occupation by the, by the Hellenists as well. So all kinds of people are looking for God to break in and bring a new world, um, different ways. The zealots called for a military insurrection to drive out the Romans and bring in the kingdom of God. They were looking like a, a figure like King David who would lead them in, a, in an insurrection, a, messiah, a messianic general to bring in God's, God's new world. The Pharisees called for another way of the kingdom of God coming in. They called for devotion to the Torah, which would bring the coming of Messiah to bring in a new age. Uh, the Essenes called for something entirely different. They had gave up on the world as it was, and they said that they were called to, to, to cloister themselves, to, to go and live faithfully by themselves away from the world and wait for now two messiahs, for a military messiah and also a priestly messiah to come and bring in new, a new age of faithfulness. So when Jesus says, the kingdom of God is coming, repent, turn around, believe the gospel, it isn't quite clear what sort of kingdom of God he's looking for, is looking at. But there it is at the beginning. And during the gospel, during the narrative in the gospel of Mark, we'll hear what that kingdom of God means. In the Galilean section, the first thing Jesus does is bring to, brings together a community. When you're still, still in chapter 1, verse 16, he walks by the lake and sees two fishermen working. He says, follow me and I will have you gathering in people. The two fishermen immediately leave their nets on the shore and follow Jesus. Right after that, he meets two other fishermen. They do the same thing. Why do they follow Jesus? Again, Mark's narrative leaves the, that raw, kind of unexplained. Jesus arrives, and they find themselves following after him. Later on in, that, in the Galilean section, he runs into Levi, the tax collector, at his table. And he, Levi hears the call to follow Jesus, and he leaves his table and follows Jesus. Now there are, by the end of chapter 4, there are about 12 disciples now following Jesus. <clears throat> no doubt there's others who are part of Jesus' community, but these are the 12 that will go with him on the ministry journey. They must have wondered, don't you think, about what the kingdom of God, this new age Jesus was speaking about, was going to look like. Would it be look like a, a kingdom like was it, looking, was it looking like something like the Zealots were talking about, or the Essenes? Was he calling them to rise up and, and uh, overthrow the Romans, or was he calling them to withdraw like the Essenes? What was it going to look like? So in Galilee, this small band of apprentices, this community of Jesus, follow Jesus, watching and listening. As you skim through the first three chapters, you will watch with them as he heals people. People broken in body or mind or spirit, it doesn't seem to matter what sort of people they were, Jesus notices them. The coming of the kingdom, it would appear, is about bringing healing, and it is about being community. The language of healing in, the, in their worldview is a language that kind of sets most of us just on our edge just a bit, because their language of healing is always about spirits, about the removal or the casting out of unclean spirits, rather than our world's language of disease, bacteria, virus, and so on. But the ministry, in whatever language you use, was of healing the broken. They would also listen to him teaching. But in Mark's Gospel especially, Jesus does not teach in long sermons. It's really disappointing for most of us, because long sermons we love, right? But no, instead he teaches in short parables, often raw, unexplained. Our text today in chapter 4, beginning at verse 30, is one of these. So let's focus in now on the text for this day. Jesus begins, So, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable shall we use for it? You know, the little church of Jesus must have leaned forward at these words, the kingdom of God. So, what is this new age about? What are we getting into? What is he asking us to do? They lean forward, and so do we. The text begins, With what shall we compare the kingdom of God? Jesus says, Well, it's like a mustard seed, which, when sown upon the ground, is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. The mustard seed in that time and place, in fact, wasn't the smallest of all seeds on earth, but it was the, the, the image used for that which is proverbially small. Uh, Jesus' statement in one of the Gospels to the disciples, you remember, he said, if you had the faith as 
a grain of mustard seed, you could tell this mountain to move from here to there. Saskatchewan, that's not that big of a problem most of the time. But this is, a, this is the image of the mustard seed that is, the, that is that which is proverbially small. Mustard was used then and now for seasoning. Sometimes it was planted, but apparently most of the time mustard wasn't planted. You got it whether you wanted it or not. Uh, mustard seeds were a little bit like dandelions. Uh, they just, they came up where they decided to come up. People did cultivate them, but often enough they were, that, they were a plant that just grew up. <clears throat> so he says, the kingdom of heaven, this breaking in of the rule of God is like a mustard seed. And then he says, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs. What an odd image. You might have expected something more like this, mighty oaks from little acorns grow, right? Some saying about something really quite quite beautiful and stately and amazing comes out of a little in a little tiny beginning. But black mustard is a herb, it's not a tree. So it, it might grow to about six feet high, maybe eight feet. The stem of the plant grew to maybe an inch thick. So the image is not exactly the one you'd expect. It isn't the acorn to the mighty oak. It is the tiny mustard seed to a really big herb that almost looks like a shrub in a way. So, listen in the parable. The mustard seed is sown. Jesus says it grows into the greatest of all her herbs. It becomes like, like a shrubbery. Now, if you're a Monty Python fan like me, you'll remember the Knights of Knee who demand when King Arthur's knights desire to have safe passage, they say, we want a shrubbery. Anyway, I don't think that has much to do with the text, but it just is unavoidable if you're a Monty Python person. So, back to the text. The text concludes that the shrubbery, listen to this, the shrubbery puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. So an ele inelegant seed, tiny, common, that grows unexpectedly into a large herb, into a shrub, gathers birds of the air so that they can make their nests in its shade. Fascinating image. What does it mean? Of course, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus offers no explanation about what it means. It's left for us to talk about it. So let's do that. Let's listen together to this surprising parable. I wonder what it sounded like to the early disciples. So this is what we're getting into. The kingdom of God, the new age, that Jesus is proclaiming, that Jesus is inviting us to be a community in the middle of, is like a mustard seed, tiny, inelegant. You know why I think they may have nodded? You see, they were mustard seed people. Who were the first disciples? Rich and famous? Hardly. The faith community began with four fishermen, then a tax collector who who was reviled by his own people by selling out to the Romans. Then Simon the Zealot, who apparently used to be a revolutionary, isn't now. Mustard seeds, each one. When you think about it, the Apostle Paul would write to his early church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians 1 in the same way. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many of you were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are. You see, the new age would come from Jesus' mustard seed people. Those early disciples must have nodded, and so do we. Now, how about the shrubbery? The mustard seed that grew into the greatest of shrubs even became a shrub. That also doesn't sound very elegant, does it? It doesn't give you an image of a, of a big, tall oak. But you know, as you follow that early church of Jesus as a community, it wasn't very elegant either. The gospel narratives, especially Mark's gospel, pulls no punches in on what knotheads the community of Jesus can be, and still is. If you turn to Mark chapter 4, just after our text, there's a storm at sea. What do the courageous Faithful disciples of Jesus say when the storm hits unexpectedly, they say this, don't you care that we're perishing here? Don't you understand? Don't you get it? 
interesting that in Matthew's version of this story, Jesus calls his disciples, you of little faith. The Greek word is mikropistos, you of micro faith. But the disciples saved most of their embarrassing moments for later. Mark chapter 9, verse 30. Jesus confides in the disciples the hard word that he is now on his way to Jerusalem to the last part of the gospel narrative where he will suffer and die. In the midst of this word, so full of sadness from their dear rabbi, the disciples do what? Verse 33. They had an argument on the road about which one of them was the most important. This inelegance, the feet of clay of the disciples is so clear. They are on the road and they're figuring it out and they're not figuring it out very quickly. This inelegance, this feet of clay of the followers of Jesus didn't stop then, as you know. When I was teaching a class on the, the history of Christianity at the University of Regina some years ago, I always wanted to apologize at the beginning of it to the students for the way Christians have literally gone to war against each other, both claiming that God is on their side. Each of you likely knows stories of a church of human frailty from your own experience. We've heard them, haven't we? People who turned Catholic and were disowned by their, their Lutheran family, or people who turned Lutheran and were, and were dis disowned by their Catholic family. Burials denied because of unpaid, unpaid benevolence. You know the stories, hard ones. But here's the thing. Jesus says, the kingdom of God breaking into the world breaks in through this shrub. Through this little church of 12 disciples, this little church of 12 mustard seed people, this little human inelegant church. The shrubbery, though, puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. The shrubbery puts forth large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. William Willimon, a longtime chaplain at Duke and author, writes this. He says, in the eyes of the world, the church looks rather pitiful and paltry. Our discipleship, though perhaps earnest, is not that impressive in the eyes of the world. And yet, for all of our flaws, the church is the body of Christ, the form the risen Christ has chosen to take in the world. And that makes all the difference. Let me tell you a little story about that. Back years ago, maybe more years than I really want to admit, when I was a young pastor in a rural community, uh, the phone rang one day. Uh, the, on the phone was the, the, uh, one of the folks I'd worked with from the funeral home. He was a Mennonite man. We had had conversations about the difference between Mennonite and, and Lutheran. We'd had a long conversation in the, just a week before about baptism and what it meant for Mennonites and what it meant for Lutherans. And it was actually a good conversation. But this day was not about that. He called to say, well, let's use the word name Bill Johnson for him. Bill Johnson passed away on the weekend. You may have met him. I did know him more by reputation. I'm not sure if I'd had a conversation with him. He was known, though, all around the town as the town drunk. Uh, that means that he was suffering from alcoholism more publicly than others who were suffering more privately. But he continued. Bill's family, you might have known, disowned him years ago, decades ago, every one of them. So there's no one willing to handle his funeral. Now, we thought that as a funeral home, we would donate the funeral for Bill. He was a human being after all. So would your community be willing to handle the church side of that? So we did. He was a human being. We were followers of Jesus, after all. We were a shrubbery, so we did. You know, I don't know if it mattered to anyone in the town that day. I don't think it made the local newspaper. I don't know if it mattered to the family either, but I do know it mattered to our faith community. It mattered to me. Our little shrub had reached out far beyond itself to give shade to one of the herding birds in God's world, yeah? No, we were not perfect, not our people, not our churches, not our pastors, not our bishops. But how many have been gathered in by the community of Jesus when they were in distress, needing food, needing a listening ear, needing a place to belong, needing love, needing a word of God. And the little shrub that is the church of Jesus reaches out 
again and again and again. So, with what shall we compare the kingdom of God, says Jesus? Well, it's like a mustard seed that grows into a shrub. And the birds of the air, the birds of the air find shade in its branches. I leave you with this odd, beautiful story to continue to turn over in your mind as you, as you walk the days late, we hope, in this pandemic, as we walk the days as the followers of Jesus. And I would leave you this challenge. Through our faith, though our faith communities may, in the eyes of the world, look insignificant, tiny as a mustard seed, though we may look sometimes even to ourselves <clears throat> like a gawky little shrub, reach out those arms of Jesus into the world in whatever way that is your gift, in whatever way that is your calling, so that the birds of God's world can find shade in your branches. For the kingdom of God is breaking into our world. Turn around and believe this good news. Believe the gospel. Amen.